vibration, haptic feedback, force feedback, kinesthetic communication, pulsation, rumble. Feeling Our Games has been called many names since it was created well over two decades ago. Although the rumble revolution started with Nintendo's Star Fox 64 and the two AAA battery-powered rumble pack, rumble technology has advanced quite a bit. Whether it's the HD rumble featured in the Switch Joy-Cons or the adaptive triggers in the latest Sony console, gamers can enjoy a further sense of immersion. Today, rumble technology might be something we take for granted in terms of home consoles, but what about handheld systems? Other than Nintendo's forgotten Pokemon mini console, no other Nintendo handheld system has had a built-in rumble feature. The Game Gear, the PSP, the Neo Geo Pocket Color, none of these other handhelds offered a rumble feature either, probably due to increased cost, durability, and battery consumption. But you know what handheld had a built-in rumble feature? The Zodiac Tap Wave! And everybody remembers that system, right? Right? Even though a built-in rumble option was not included in Nintendo's handheld hardware, that didn't stop a few brave developers and publishers from incorporating a rumble option in some Game Boy Color games, with a few of these being backwards compatible with the original Game Boy or Game Boy Pocket. The US saw a total of 16 officially released Game Boy Color games with the rumble pack built directly into the cartridge. Powered by a single AAA battery and outfitted with a larger shell, these carts are undoubtedly unique for a handheld that saw over 1,000 games released. In this video, each Game Boy Rumble Pack game will be featured, highlighting how the Rumble option works specifically within that game's gameplay. I'm also going to showcase the Rumble games that were never released outside of Japan, and be sure to watch to the end because I found some interesting Rumble-based facts in doing this Rumble research, as well as talk about games that could have possibly benefited from incorporating a forced feedback option. Out of the 16 U.S. released Game Boy Rumble Pack games, Morningstar Multimedia developed three of them, and they're all pretty terrible. Tenpin Bowling is the quintessential example of games sounding good on paper, but then failing when put into practice. This bowling sim tries way too hard and winds up being overly complex, never fun, and always frustrating. As you approach the foul line by holding down the A button, using the D-pad to control spin and power with any sort of consistency and accuracy is impossible, and even if you manage to connect with any pins, the pin physics don't make any sense. In the numerous games that I've played, I've never once hit a strike and only nailed a spare a couple of times. It's really difficult to hit any pins at all. The presentation is tasteless and boring, just like the gameplay. The complete lack of music makes the experience feel empty, and the few sound effects generate a cringeworthy buzz as if the GBC is releasing too much power for the speaker. Other than a two-player pass the console option, there's no options whatsoever. There's no practice mode, you can't set up the pins in any configuration, change the lanes, mini games. you can't even select the ball's color or weight. You can't even see the score of your previous frames until the very end of the game when the player is given the chance to slowly scroll the screen to the left. Out of all the Game Boy Color games that featured the Rumble Pack, this is easily the worst. So what's up with the Rumble Pack feature? Well, as the ball connects with pins, guess what? It rumbles. I'd say the vibration is exactly what you would expect and doesn't add anything to the empty and overly complicated gameplay. If you're playing this game on an emulator or without a battery in the cartridge, you're not going to be missing anything. And unfortunately, the Incuda Rumble feature isn't enough to save this gutter ball. Left Field Productions made two Game Boy Color Rumble Pack games, the other being Little Mermaid 2 Pinball Frenzy. Strangely enough, this game's only table and entire theme is built around Hershey Park, a real-life theme park based in Pennsylvania. The candy license is laid on pretty thick as players are greeted with Hershey chocolate bars and Reese's peanut butter cups. In this game, the screen scrolls smoothly, the visuals are colorful, there's a ton of targets to hit, Multiball is always a cool reward, and high scores are saved via battery backup. Unfortunately, I did encounter an issue where the ball got stuck on more than one occasion. The rumble feature does add that extra layer of depth, so it is the recommended way to play this handheld game, even though it works exactly how you would expect it to. Thankfully, there's varying degrees of vibration, so you're not just feeling the same boring buzz over and over. Tapping the small bumpers at the top of the screen feels different than hitting the larger bumpers, or going up a ramp, or triggering that bonus, for example. It's still a decent pinball game without it, but if you have the option, make sure you turn that rumble pack on. 
If viewed on its own, hole-in-one golf is about as good as a bogey hitting from the front tees. If compared to Mario Golf, the fan favorite on this system, hole-in-one golf is a triple bogey. But, as one unique feature, this is one of three Rumble Pack games that is compatible both on original Game Boy and Game Boy Color units. Each hole from the three available courses all awkwardly scroll from left to right. The swing meter is tedious and inaccurate, and the putting almost makes this game unplayable. Instead of the C-shaped typical three-tap interface, Natsumi's design automatically starts a horizontal bar in which the player taps once to stop it, and then taps it one more time with an indicator moving along the picture of a golf ball. The abrupt start and stop is jarring and makes putting almost impossible, especially from short distances. The hole-in animation is also laughably bad, there are no RPG features, and the player cannot even select their golfer stance or clubs. Ah, but the worst part is the ear-piercing music loop. Instead of continuing as one long song, this shortly loop track restarts every time the screen transitions. The music is even more annoying than the one track found in NASCAR Championship, which we'll talk about in a minute, and could be the reason alone not to play this game. So what's up with the Rumble Pack feature? Well, when you swing the club, the player feels a short vibration to indicate that the club made contact with the ball. Yeah! That's it, not really adding anything to the gameplay. This is a bland use of the Rumble Pack. I guess it's better than not having it at all, but you're absolutely not missing anything with this option deactivated. Missile Command. This arcade game has been ported to almost every gaming system since the early 80s, Game Boy Color included. Unfortunately, if you played this arcade game before, there is no need to play this handheld version as there's no staying power, options, or extras whatsoever. This is straight up missile command, using both the A and B buttons to shoot a limited supply of missiles from the bottom of the screen to stop incoming projectiles from the top. Each stage only lasts a minute. Gameplay is fast, but the difficulty ramps up quickly, and once defeated, the player is simply booted back to the main menu to try again. This is a short burst arcade game trying to be entertaining on a handheld console. Each stage takes place in a popular city over two levels. Survive both stages and be greeted with the screen transitioning two-frame animation of that particular city. For example, the Statue of Liberty in New York has the statue twitching her face and the Sphinx's nose in the Cairo stage falls off for some reason. These animations are more awkward than anything and it's a wonder why they were included at all. This is bare bones missile command through and through, but I guess this is better than going through another Cold War. The only thing majorly different with this version of Missile Command comes from the Rumble Pack feature. As the player launches a missile, the game vibrates. There's no variance in the amount or the type of vibration either, and it works exactly as expected. Just like the gameplay, the Rumble feature is short-lived and not necessary. For a licensed game, NASCAR Challenge is about as bare bones as it gets, and it has some odd design choices. Before you can race against other AI-controlled cars, the player must complete a solo qualifying run. If you beat the qualifying time, the player is rewarded by playing the same track against AI racers. Fortunately, this is not a good racing game, even for a Game Boy Color game released in 1999. Outside of selecting a few different tracks, there are literally no options or features whatsoever. There is no option to select a vehicle, you can't adjust the car's attributes, you can't even change drivers. The AI cars tediously get in your way, each track is flatter than a pancake, there's no two-player link mode, and there is no tie-in with the NASCAR license at all. If this game was titled General Racing Game, it would be no different. The one music track is also designed to drive you insane. As not fun as this game is, the only saving grace is the rumble feature. As the car gains speed off the starting line, the rumble feature slowly increases. Once the car reaches max speed, the rumble motor also hits max vibration. This means that the game is constantly vibrating, which brings that extra level of detail to the gameplay. The downside, however, since the game is always shaking, the AAA battery will be drained in the shortest amount of time, and after playing the qualifying lap and then one race, you might just want to turn the rumble feature off. That is, as if you can tolerate playing another race. The rumble feature is pretty good, but it isn't enough to save the boring gameplay. This is the worst GBC racing game with the rumble feature.
Perfect Dark could possibly be the Game Boy Color cart with the most features on the system. Taking place before the events of the popular N64 title, the majority of this prequel is a basic top-down sort of stealth action game where Joanna Dark and her huge sprite murders countless bad guys and then ransacks their corpses. Besides using the Rumble Pack, the game also features a Spy Hunter type driving segment, there are sniper missions, and there are boss battles against helicopters and some dude who throws ninja stars. When the campaign is completed, a level select gets unlocked, more multiplayer assets become available, the Game Boy printer can be used to print stickers of characters' faces, and the GBC game can even be used with the N64 transfer pack to unlock cheats in the N64 version of Perfect Dark. Gameplay isn't anything too spectacular, and the Simon Says Door Decoder minigame is dumb and never fun, but there is no denying the number of features in this forgotten handheld game is nothing short of impressive. Ah, Rare really was something special in the late 90s and early 2000s. So how does the rumble feature work in Perfect Dark? When Joanna takes damage or collides with something during one of the minigame sequences, the rumble pack shakes. Very straightforward, very simple. You so desire. Be yes, sir. I understand. Chances are, if you played a Game Boy Color game with the Rumble Pack, it was most likely Pokemon Pinball. Compatible with both the Game Boy Color and original Game Boy hardware, anything Pokemon in the late 90s and early 2000s sold exceptionally well, and this cart isn't hard to find even today. The Pokemon Pinball games are great because they give you more incentive besides trying to obtain a high score. You need to catch Pokemon. Outfitted with both a red and blue table, the player needs to summon Pokemon by activating triggers. Once a Pokemon appears, a few hits with the Pokeball will capture it and unlock that portion of the Pokedex found in the main menu. Players can even swap high scores using the underutilized infrared port. Unfortunately, due to the limitations of the hardware, the screen hard cuts whenever a ball passes between the upper and lower portions of the board. These screen transitions make the game a little difficult to play. What is cool, however, is the ability to completely customize the controls from the main menu. Wouldn't it be cool if more games offered this level of customization? Pokemon Pinball will continue on the Game Boy Advance with Pokemon Pinball, Ruby and Sapphire. Since the GBA is a more powerful system, gameplay is much improved and deeper than the Game Boy Color original and even carries over the rumble feature. Well, sort of. When inserted into a Game Boy player playing on the GameCube and used with the standard controller, not a wave bird, the player can experience gameplay with the rumble feature intact. Okay, so how does the rumble feature work in this game? Well, it works exactly how you would expect. You feel all the bombs, triggers, and bonuses, but if you really pay attention, you can feel that there are different levels of vibration. Hitting a smaller bumper, for example, generates a small buzz, while hitting bigger flippers creates slightly stronger vibrations. Although fully playable and enjoyable without the rumble feature, it does make the game a little more entertaining if you did want to search for these pocket monsters hiding in these pinball slots instead of the tall grass. Of all the Game Boy Color games with the Rumble Pack feature, Polaris Snowcross plays the best. Although marred with a high level of difficulty with no option to change the level of challenge, the control feels right, the snow sleds are rendered in beautiful 3D, the frame rate is smooth, and there is even a two-player link mode. The short track length is also perfect for a GBC game. It is a bit of a shame because the engine that's used is freakishly smooth for a Game Boy Color game, there's just no options in which to indulge. The championship mode pits you against two other racers, being the first to cross the line awards the player with the trophy and skill points to increase the stats of your racer. Fail, and you get nothing. Other than the two-player link mode, there are no other options and there isn't even time trials. In fact, this is a racing game without a timer. It sucks because there's a solid foundation here. Everything looks great, especially the racers. Each track has also been created with care as bumps and the half pipe look 3D and the frame rate never dips. In fact, this is a high speed racer as each match only lasts about a minute. If a few more options were implemented, this game could have easily gone from good to outstanding. Polar Snowcross is a good racing game even without the rumble feature. The vibration activates with each jump, bump, or collision, and it's composed of varying degrees. Is it necessary to enjoy this game? 
No, but it is a welcome feature if you have the ability to experience it. It actually doesn't surprise me that the rumble feature was included in this game considering the high quality of the racing segment. It's just too bad that there's no data transfer option with the transfer pack to the N64 version. Ready to Rumble is best known for its Dreamcast release as it was a standout launch title for the system back in the fall of 1999. Released a few months later, Crawfish Interactive and Midway ported their one-on-one -on -one fighter to Nintendo's handheld system. Unlike the console version, this Game Boy Color port doesn't feature any mini-games, leveling mechanics, two-player link mode, or even music. There is an attempt to create some strategy when trying to combo low blows, hooks, uppercuts, and defensive maneuvers, but the gameplay is nothing more than just a one-dimensional button masher. I can only imagine how much it cost to acquire the rights to Michael Buffer and his famous let's get ready to rumble phrase. Making sure they got every penny's worth out of it though, the player must sit through a static image of Mike screaming his well-known tagline before every bout. In a strange contrast though, the fighters received a digitized 5 second animated cutscene, but without any voice work. I guess it's pretty cool to see a heavily compressed digital video clip on a Game Boy Color console, but it doesn't add anything to the gameplay. In fact, it just gets in the way because the player will just jam on the start button to skip it every time. The voice samples are also so compressed they cause the Game Boy speaker to create an ear-piercing buzz noise, so you won't even want to hear the famous tagline shouted before each match. Okay, so the Rumble Pack feature. Although it's fully playable without this feature, feeling the force of each hit does add something to the gameplay. It's one of those things where you sort of miss it when it isn't there. However, there's only one degree of vibration as each hit feels the same whether you're connecting with a quick jab or an uppercut. At the same time, Ready to Rumble has the best unexpected and creative use of the Rumble feature out of any Rumble Pack compatible Game Boy Color game. When the game first boots up, the rumble feature syncs in tune with the famous let's get ready to rumble tagline. It's totally unnecessary, but that's why it's so great, and it gets the player hyped for playing a Game Boy Color game with the rumble pack feature. Star Wars Episode 1 Racer on Game Boy Color is unique for a couple reasons. First, it's a racing game that pits the player against one other computer AI racer. Which is strange because the movie featured dozens of racers in that memorable scene. Racing solo against one other player is limiting, but this compromise was made most likely due to the track length and variety. Each race takes a few minutes to complete and the character roster is robust. The other reason why this licensed product is unique is from its top-down gameplay. Although there are other Game Boy Color Rumble Pack games that use a top-down view, Episode 1 Racer is by far the fastest. In fact, races are so fast, the game indicates when a turn is approaching with an arrow at the top of the screen. If the arrow has a sharper bend, the more aggressive the turn. Like real pod racing, you need to use the power of the force to accurately play this game, let alone win. Okay, so how does the rumble feature work in this challenging little racer? It does something similar to Ready to Rumble Boxing with impressive effect. You see, the rumble feature shakes violently as little Anakin kicks his pod racer into high gear during the opening video clip. As for the rest of the game, it's par for the course. The player will feel a quick buzz when you bump into a wall, but it will grow in intensity when making lingering contact. Like many other Game Boy Color Rumble Pack games, it isn't necessary, but it does increase the enjoyability just a little bit more. Test Drive Off-Road 3 is another top-down racer in the final Rumble Pack game that can be played on both Game Boy Color and original Game Boy consoles. When playing on an original Game Boy or Game Boy Pocket, it's almost unplayable due to the choppy frame rate. Thankfully, playing on a Game Boy Color console looks a million times better as bright colors make the game much easier to see. Tracks are also wide and sport bumps, jumps, and hills. This is one of the better Game Boy Color Rumble Pack racing games due to the number of options that are available. Players can unlock real life vehicles and upgrade them, play a cop patrol mode, and it has a pretty good soundtrack. The frame rate always chugs, but the slower pace of play can actually work to the player's favor as it's easier to make tight turns. All in all, it's not so bad. So how does the rumble feature work in this game? Well, when a vehicle lands from a jump or bumps into another racer, it vibrates. For this game, I like it a little bit better than the other racers, because here each jump or bump means something and it's not going to drain your AAA battery. 
What's strange about Little Mermaid 2 Pinball Frenzy is this game was released two months before 3D Ultra Pinball Thrill Ride, Left Field Production's other Game Boy Color Rumble Pack pinball title, yet this game has way more content. Unlike Thrill Ride, Little Mermaid 2 has two tables and a bunch of unlockable mini-games. Perhaps Disney threw a little bit more money at this handheld game, and Thrill Ride isn't a bad pinball game by any means, but this is the better pinball game. Do not let the name and target audience distract you. Why Disney thought a pinball game was a good marketing tie-in for their straight-to-DVD cinematic release is anybody's guess, but hey, it plays well and there's a lot of stuff here. Having two tables with entirely different layouts and mini games to boot, there is a lot here. The colorful presentation and musical soundtrack should also make fans hum along to this poorly reviewed sequel about a female who literally gives up her voice to be with a man. In terms of Rumble, this is exactly the same game as 3D Ultra Pinball Thrill Ride, as both these games use the same engine, visual charm, and rumble detail. Totally playable and enjoyable without the rumble pack, but it is encouraged to use this neglected feature if given the chance. A top-down, claustrophobic racer, Tonka Raceway is boring, limited, and it's easy to tell it was made on a budget with a tight deadline. Although there are a few different vehicles to select, all play exactly the same and look like colored blobs. The biggest problem comes from the track design. Each track is the width of a couple of cars, so you'll constantly smash into the AI racers or on the side of the road. And the tracks are pallet swapped too, so they're trying to create more content when there really isn't any. This is nothing more than a subpar licensed single player racing game. Very basic and highly skippable. The Rumble Pack is the only thing unique about this game, but it doesn't add to the overall fun factor. Like NASCAR Challenge, the game rumbles to mimic the car's engine, so it's always active but starts to get annoying by the second track and it's going to drain your battery pretty quickly. Stronger vibrations will trigger when bumping into opponents or the edges of the screen too. Since each track is narrow, this will happen more often than not. Honestly, it's cool that the Rumble feature is there, but it's entirely not needed. Top Gear Pocket plays well, but it's a very limited experience. With only a couple selectable cars and tracks, replay value is restricted. Making matters worse, the game uses a password system to keep track of progress instead of saving to a battery. Championship mode is a typical race against the AI option, time trial is a boring 4 minute solo race, but there is a 2 player mode if you have a link cable and a willing friend. Controlling each car feels good though, and the cartoony graphics are some of the brightest on the system. The biggest and most exciting difference with Top Gear Pocket, as opposed to the other behind the car racers, is the addition of bumps and dips. Not driving on a flat plane makes each race feel much more exciting, although each track is mostly composed of simple straightaways and an occasional tight turn. Strangely enough, there isn't any music when racing, but the main menu features a sound test mode. Unfortunately, the motor's whirring sound effect easily and quickly reaches ear-piercing levels during these longer laps, especially when playing solo in time trial mode. Top Gear Pocket is the first Game Boy Color title to be released with the Rumble Pack feature, so it deserves some props. Unlike NASCAR Challenge, the Rumble Pack isn't always on and does not vibrate in sync with the speed of the vehicle. Instead, the player will only feel the force speed back during bumps, jumps, or tight turns. Although the game is a little more entertaining when using the Rumble Pack, it isn't required by any means. Out of all the GBC Rumble Pack games, Vigilante 8 is easily one of the most detailed and feature-rich titles, really only second to Perfect Dark. This top-down vehicular arena shooter not only has a wealth of single-player options, it is one of the few games to actually put a lot of effort in the two-player link mode. There is a standard verse mode, but players can also enjoy co-op. The smaller vehicles allow players the space needed to navigate the environment. The only downside is the lack of buttons and a second D-pad, or even a touchscreen. This really should have been a twin-stick shooter as the player can only move and shoot in the same direction, resulting in annoying and expected loops to chase opponents. As big as the environments are, they can be a little tedious to navigate due to some small hazards sprinkled throughout each stage, but the voice work is especially well done, but this weird blue menu doesn't do the game any favors. 
So the Rumble Pack vibrates when the player takes damage, bumps into obstacles, or rams into opponents. In other words, it works exactly how you would expect, and it's not always on like in the other driving games. And to be clear, this really isn't a racing game, it's a vehicle combat game ported to the GBC from its console brethren. Do you need to play this game without the Rumble Pack feature active? Nah. Zebco Fishing is about as basic as a fishing game you'll ever play. From a top-down view, players navigate a lake from a boat, press one button to cast a line, then another to snag the fish. This is all done from the same perspective, so the player never actually sees the fish, there's no underwater view, and there isn't even a fish radar. You simply cast your line, hope a fish bites, and reel it in. There are two lakes, but there's no other options, there's no cool features outside of blackjack fishing, where the goal is to snag a certain collective fish weight. Okay, so here's the deal. The Rumble Pack featured in Zemco Fishing is the most controversial out of all the GBC Rumble Pack games. It's not that the Rumble feature is necessarily well done, but rather it's almost required. Since perspective never breaks from the top-down viewpoint, the only indicator of snagging fish comes literally from feeling the tug on the line. As soon as the vibration starts, the player needs to tap the B button within a fraction of the second to snag the fish, otherwise it's going to get away, and then you hold the A button to reel it in. Without the rumble feature, this game is almost unplayable, and I say it's almost unplayable because the only other indicator of catching a potential fish is from a tiny text box in the bottom right of the UI. This text box displays a verb depending on the player's situation. If playing this game on an emulator, you're going to need to watch this text box as it's the only indicator to what is happening and when a fish is on the line. Since this game relies so heavily on the rumble pack, players will practically need it whether they like it or not. So there you have it. All 16 Game Boy games with the built-in rumble feature released in North America. If you look at these games, seven of them are racing slash driving games, three are pinball titles, and with the exception of Missile Command, an arcade game, and Perfect Dark, the only action-based shooter, the rest are sports-related titles, boxing, fishing, bowling. It's a shame that the Rumble Pack wasn't using more interesting games or really anything else than the expected racing, pinball, and fishing titles. Most of these games listed here just use vibration in exactly the way that you would expect. Swing a club, get a rumble. Bump a wall, feel a jolt. Rev an engine, feel it grow. Where are the RPGs, the platformers, even puzzle games? The same expected rumble inclusion mostly holds true for Japanese release rumble pack games too. The Legend of River King 2, Super Black Bass, Real Fight, and Super Real Fishing are all fishing based titles and are way more entertaining than Zebco Fishing. An additional point goes to River King 2 as it's a charming little RPG and it was released here in America, but without the rumble pack built into the cart. Top Gear Pocket 2 was also released in America, but without the Rumble Pack feature built into the cart. I guess the publisher couldn't justify the added cost, probably referencing the original sales data. But just like the first game, Top Gear Pocket 2 is a decent GBC racing game, and should probably check it out if given the opportunity. The biggest difference comes from Chi Chai Alien, one of the few games that not only made use of the Game Boy Color's infrared sensor, but made it a major component to gameplay. There really isn't much game here as the player is supposed to collect real world light beams for digital creatures, and even if there was a fan translation available, good luck finding that special infrared attachment accessory. And finally, Kite's Adventure is basically another River King title, only with the heavier emphasis on story, and Mina's Insect Book is sort of like Pokemon where the player can collect hundreds of insects, add them to a book, and then trade them with friends. It's interesting that Nintendo didn't develop their own Game Boy games to support the Rumble Pack. Although it's expected for them to publish Pokemon Pinball, what happened to Mario, Wario, or even the Donkey Kong Country games? Which got me thinking, which Game Boy Color games could have benefited from having the Rumble Pack feature built directly into their cartridge? Here's a few considerations. What about the three Zelda games? Link's Awakening, Oracle of Seasons, Oracle of Ages. Sure, you would feel it when Link swings the Master Sword or a bomb explodes, but what if a note was taken from Ocarina of Time? In the N64 game, players could connect a rumble pack to feel when a secret was nearby. Instead of hearing the seashell chime when walking into a screen in Link's Awakening, it could have been cool to feel it if the game shook when a secret was nearby or a fairy or a large rupee. Rumble doesn't always have to be collision related. Rhino Rumble. Rumble's already in the title, so not including the Rumble Pack is a missed opportunity. 
this bubble spitting rhino adventure is a little strange, but this one would mostly be there just to support its namesake. Metal Gear Solid. Psycho Man has shook our controllers on PS1, so there's no reason why we shouldn't feel Marionette Owl's presence when fighting in the dark or luring a guard by tapping on walls. MGS is already an amazing game and had a lot of potential for incorporating the rumble feature as it's a title loaded with extras. For more information on Metal Gear Solid, I actually played through the entire game right here on my YouTube channel. Ultimate Fighting Championship and Knockout Kings. If Ready to Rumble Boxing used the Rumble Pack, why should another fighting games? Maybe Street Fighter 2 or the GB port of Killer Instinct could have also benefited? Rampage 2 Universal Tour. This sequel adds two-player link support, new playable monsters, the visuals are upgraded over the original Game Boy Color release, and the gameplay mechanics are improved. It probably would have been cool to feel the cities you're destroying. What about Shadowgate Classic? Like the Zelda idea, the rumble feature could have been used as a hint system. And finally, why not Evil Knievel? The creators of Grand Theft Auto released this forgotten Trials clone, and perhaps the rumble pack could have been used to enhance the scope of the jumps, as well as those painful crashes. Okay, so what about those random facts I mentioned at the beginning of the video? As one additional bit of Game Boy Color rumble pack based trivia, Developer Mike and Micah has worked on many games, including a number of Game Boy Color titles. He made a Twitter post in February 2021 mentioning his work on the Game Boy Color version of Disney's Tarzan and claims the rumble feature was implemented, although the game shipped without a rumble pack. Apparently, if you play the Tarzan ROM on a special Game Boy Color development cart with the rumble pack, the rumble feature will work. Of course, I don't have one of these rare dev cards, so I can't test it myself, but this is very interesting because Tarzan is a platformer, and there are no platformer-based Rumble Pack games on Game Boy Color, putting this in a category all of its own. If you happen to have one of these Game Boy Color flash cards with the built-in Rumble Pack and can test Tarzan, please share. Speaking of flashcards, Nintendo DS R4 cards grant users additional features not found through normal means. One of these features are playing emulated games, and playing Game Boy Color Rumble Pack games on original hardware is unique because the Rumble Pack cannot be emulated. Or can it? The emulator named Goomba is designed to play original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games on the Nintendo DS hardware. Digging through the emulator's menu is an option to activate the Rumble Pack. This means you can play Game Boy Color games through this DS emulator using an R4 card and a Nintendo DS Rumble Pack, another forgotten accessory that uses slot 2 or the GBA port on the bottom of the console. Unfortunately, I could not get this feature to work. Maybe I'm not using the most up-to-date emulator or something's wrong with the ROM file. Either way, this would be a super cool way to experience Game Boy Color Rumble Pack games on the DS, especially since the DS Rumble Pack feels a lot different than the quality of vibration in the Game Boy Color games. If you can get this DS feature to work, please let me know in the comments below. Finally, if you're considering collecting Game Boy Color Rumble Pack games, the biggest annoyance is the battery cover. For whatever reason, finding Rumble Pack cards with the battery cover can be a bit of a challenge. There's a few websites out there that can sell you a replacement cover for around 5 bucks, but better yet, you can 3D print your own. These covers were 3D printed using an inexpensive white and black material, so the colors aren't going to match, but hey, it works, and it's an option. So that's pretty much everything you need to know about Game Boy Color Rumble Pack games. I'm curious to know what you think. Did you play these games back in the GBC era? Are you interested in rummaging through Game Boy bins at a game convention to look for these games? What games do you think would have benefited from having a Rumble Pack? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to follow me on Twitter at ZachGaz. Thank you for watching and game on.